Welcome to Narrative for Change. I'm David Bank. I'm the editor and CEO of Impact Alpha. We're a five-day-a-week morning brief that many of you receive. Many of you have been in the brief um, all around impact investing. And I'm so excited about this, this discussion. I want to thank the SOCAP folks and the Kellogg Foundation folks for inviting me to join. And I want to just briefly bring in the guests, and then I'll set a little context and we'll, we'll keep rolling. So um, Larry Marcus, uh, the managing director of Marcy Ventures with Jay-Z here in the Bay Area. Welcome, Larry. Hi, David. And Poppy Hanks uh, down in LA, the executive vice president of Macro Media, which many of you will know from, from, from all the shows you've been watching. So welcome, Poppy. Thank you for having me. And Carla thompson Payton, um, the Vice President for Program Strategy at the Kellogg Foundation, coming to us from Philadelphia. Hi, Carla. Hello, how are you? Um, you know, narrative change is just, it, it's kind of uh, in, in the air, I guess. Um, but uh, I just want to say that we want to claim it too at Impact Alpha. We're, we're in the business of narrative change as well. And we've been seeing that narrative shift over time, maybe partly as a result of us, but mostly just things that are happening. People seeing that more can be done with finance, that finance can be a tool for change, that um, new models, new audiences, new consumers, new products, all of this can add up to a kind of new, I don't know, a reimagining of, 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 of even capitalism. And... Um, uh, but we do it with 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 news and stories and, and deals and whatnot. I'm very excited to to work uh, to have this conversation with all of you who are doing it, it you know, in, in in culture and 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 film and and television and and um, and, and in a sense, you know, the, the engaging really the popular culture um, around narrative change. So let's just really jump in. What I would love to, you to do is. Give me an example of a narrative you're trying to disrupt, perhaps, or a narrative that you're trying to establish, and um, and tell us a little bit about yourselves as well. Maybe just start with you, Larry, if that's okay. That's great. Thank you, David. And I want to just uh, correct something you said at the beginning. My partner, my co-founders in Marcy Venture Partners are Jay Brown and Jay Z. Oh, I'm sorry, then, another Jay. No worries. Uh, the Jays were incredible partners and. Um, what we're doing at Mercy Venture Partners is we're investing in consumer culture and positive impact. And consumer is super broadly defined. So everything from fashion to skincare and beauty, food and beverage, uh, to any kind of consumer product, transportation services, housewares, things like that, uh, and, and technology-enabled products. The culture is really a nod to where things are going. And particularly to Gen Z, where, where culture tends to move the fastest. So even if it's not targeting that group, we just like to know that we're really in line with culture. And the positive impact is very much all about inclusivity, sustainability, accessibility, health and wellness. So we really like to do products and services that have that positive um, impact element. And uh, we're, we're lead investors and we came together um, because we really felt like there, in terms of like what what's really different is that there's been kind of this sameness in venture capital. And we really um, wanted to bring together our diverse backgrounds to really um, make it a real difference in the ecosystem in terms of how we can identify, you know, support and work with companies. And, and it's been really exciting and it's been wonderful to partner up with uh, the Kellogg Foundation, all of our shared values as well. Terrific. So uh, maybe disrupting the narrative of venture capital is, is, is part of the story today. Thank you. Poppy? Hello. Uh, Poppy Hanks, EVP of Macromedia. Um, we, uh, we are a production finance company, uh, and our mission and mandate is to, to tell stories through a multicultural lens in front of and behind the camera, um, which is disruptive in its own right. I think uh, to follow the the prompt, you know, the narrative that we're very eager to disrupt is the fact that these type of projects and content uh, doesn't travel worldwide and it's not global and will not do well overseas. Um, and we're very eager to dive into that and, and prove that narrative wrong. 
okay, we're gonna we're gonna get we're gonna get deeper into that uh, uh, global perspective as well as as well as some of the stories. Carla, um, you you you've helped bring us together. Thank you. Yes, thank you. I'm so excited to be a part of this conversation today because this is on a topic that's near and dear to the Kellogg Foundation. I'm Carla Thompson Payton, Vice President for Program Strategy, and I lead strategy development for our domestic and international portfolios. At the foundation, children are the heart of everything that we do, which is why narrative change is so incredibly important. We need to understand that children live within the context of their families and families live within the context of communities. And how we approach that and how we support them creates equitable opportunities. And we're well aware that too many communities are not thriving to the best of their ability. And so for us, thinking about it both from our programmatic vantage point, but also our investment vantage point, is how can we build expansive capital systems that supports creating pathways of equitable opportunity and have a commitment and an intention to advancing racial equity? I sponsor our mission-driven investment program, and we have a phenomenal team of women women of color leading our mission-driven investment portfolio. And they understand the importance of narrative change and the importance of making sure that all of our grant making and investments tell positive stories about people of color and women. That's why we're investing in macro media. That's why we're investing in Marcy Ventures because we believe that the work that they're pursuing is a great opportunity to provide pathways for other companies. Both of these are diverse led companies telling stories around underrepresented people, reaching markets that are often untapped, unappreciated, and often misunderstood. And so today, really the narrative change that I wanna see happen is that we're challenging all of you who are watching and listening to do better, to be active and to engage. Actually, that's really interesting. I wanted to pick up on that too, because I think there is a kind of a dominant narrative, almost, um, uh, I don't know, a little bit of despair. Maybe I'm channeling my own my own mood or something. But there's sometimes a, um, a, 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 a sense that things are are stuck and can't change. And then if you look back and you look forward, you see that things actually do change. And I want to invite each of you again to maybe give us an example of either an investment or a project, a, a, a film project, as it were, or 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 or, or, or a company that. Um, that kind of challenged the narrative and took on something and 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 made and made a change. So, um, give give us give us one or two of your favorites. Um, maybe Poppy, um, uh, let let's switch up the order and start with you. I always try not to do that. Sorry. Um, one project that I I will talk about um, that macro uh, we identified it. We had it set up. It was a TV show called Raising Dion. And Raising Dion is about, a, um, it's about a single black mom who's raising her eight-year-old son and he has superpowers. And while I think there are pros and cons to it, but the show um, ended up being uh, produced and distributed on Netflix and Netflix's global reach is really phenomenal. Um, you know, they reach 190 countries. And I think going back to the point of, of, you know, global disruption, this particular show performed very well in Kenya, in Nigeria, in Germany, and was able to reach places that I think we are often told that, you know, other companies that are not streaming won't put the the money behind the marketing to expand, you know, I, I realize television and film are, are different and it's a different platform, but it's just something that we're super proud of in terms of where it was able to reach when we're constantly being told there's no audience um, and people seeing themselves and their children. That's interesting. There's, there's kind of this rise in, in futuristic or superhero uh, films and movies, films and, and TV shows um, that feature people of color as main characters. Um, it, 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 is that why is that working? Why is that happening? What is what does that mean? Um, I mean, I think you know when you're looking at creative and commerce, and you get into what are the buckets that tend to kind of travel across many lanes. I think that genre does that horror and fantasy 
um, do it in a way that tend to reach audiences in a way that a straight drama won't. There's a level of escapism. There's a level of wish fulfillment. And I think it's, it's easier to peddle. It's easier to receive um, for some people as opposed to, you know, we did have a lot of reach and success on, on Just Mercy as well, but that's a different type of message. It's a different, and it's very direct, um, you know, and so it's, it's a little, so you're signing up for something different when you, when you decide to partake in it. Right. That makes sense. Right. Right. Um, Larry, um, uh, uh, give us, give us one of your favorite, uh, investments or, or ventures or, or just ideas that is, is changing the story. Yeah, well, look, I think one of the things that we're excited about in changing the story of just in general is just being a great example that in an industry, you know, in venture capital, which really just has uh, very little dollars allocated, you know, to women or people of color, you know, in our portfolio, which is you know, really we're a top performing um, VC, uh, we're probably two thirds women and people of color. And I think that there's a lot of good reasons why uh, investing in people who, you know, may have faced adversity, who have tremendous tenacity and drive, you know, while, why they're going to succeed in the marketplace. And I think people, you know, tend to just want to, you know, invest in what they know and just want to be safe. And somehow, you know, there's some, some bizarre risk bias that might be applied um, to people, you know, to women, people of color in particular. And, you know, it's just a false narrative. And I think that one of the great things is just showing, you know, with, with data and returns, you know, just how powerful it is. And frankly, it's where culture, you know, is heading. And so I think if you look towards, you know, Gen Z and how they feel about products and services and the values, you know, and the meaning, you know, a lot of the companies today are really very out of step with that. So I think being, you know, in touch with culture and where it's really going, you know, that's, that's sort of a key, you know, macro, um, you know, a key macro trend for us. To, to, to coin a phrase. Yes. <laughs> um, Carla. I was trying um, not to smile and it didn't work. <laughs> Uh, uh, so, so look, in terms of, of companies, um, you know, each one like has an incredible, you know, story unto itself. And I'd say, you know, what they share is they have, you know, incredible brands that people love with lots of growth drivers and, you know, values that are really, you know, in tune to where culture is headed and, you know, could be from like a Savage X Fenty where, um, you know, Rihanna is a co-founder, you know, of the business where it's really, you know, shifting the narrative around beauty and really uh, this sort of message around, you know, beauty is very inclusive and whether, you know, whether regardless of your color or your size, you know, that it's really um, all about feeling great about yourself and, and that kind of empowerment, you know, which is really wonderful. And actually the, uh, the Savage X, Fenty Fashion Show Volume Three is just out on Amazon Prime, and it's it's a wonderful show, and uh, would really encourage you, you know, everybody to to go and watch it. It's really quite inspiring. Terrific. Actually, one of the themes emerging here, Carla, is that the commercial success of these kind of projects in these companies itself changes the narrative because. It, it maybe puts the lie to the notion that there's not not interest or there's not an audience, um, you know, that 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 maybe that people have not thought deeply enough about what that audience mm -hmm. is or where 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 folks are, are at. Um, what, what are you thinking about how the yeah. how the how the commercial aspect actually changes the narrative? So, I mean, the stories that we hear are always grounded in structural <laughs> racism, conscious and unconscious bias, biases being key barriers. And, you know, we see this in the entrepreneur sector that we support. We see this with women and people of color who are trying to raise capital to support their businesses and grow their businesses. And it's one of the narratives that we're trying to change. And we're doing it by investing in opportunities and in entrepreneurship and women leadership to really say that narrative is actually false and based on premises that are grounded in racism and bias. And so... For example, 
we have a lot of investment happening in the city of Detroit. It's the fourth largest city in America for entrepreneurship by people of color. And the businesses are struggling to support, to secure the necessary financing. And we're trying to figure out why is this happening and why is it that there's ton of business, ton of bright ideas, but there can't come to fruition. And so we've been working with a JP Morgan Chase around creating a fund so that entrepreneurs of color who are experiencing barriers to accessing capital have a pathway. And for instance, Angel Paris, she's been doing decades of work as an owner operator of Power Light and Technical. And it's an electrical contracting firm that has revenues that gross roughly around 1.5 million. She's been, she was banking with this bank for well over 10 years. Her business has been stable for the past eight years. And she went to them for a loan and they denied her. No reason why, we can't figure it out. But she was able to go to this fund that JP Morgan Chase and Kellogg created in 2015 called Entrepreneurs of Color Fund. And she was able to secure a $200,000 line of credit, which she describes as a game changer for her business. And we see the same issue in asset management. You know, people of color and women account for two thirds of the US population, yet represent only 1.3% of assets under management in the investment industry. And so we really want to change that narrative. We want to bring to light that these biases can no longer continue to be a hindrance to folks who have the spirit, the drive, the zeal, the knowledge, and the know-how to be successful. And so we've been working on putting together some knowledge products. We just put out one with the McKinsey Company, really around creating talent pipelines within financial services and having pathways for senior leadership within these corporations, because we want to see change and we want to hold people accountable. And when they tell us they don't know how to do it, we want to be able to refer them to these documents so that they can learn how to do it. And so for us, it's around hearing these stories, telling these stories, sharing them, creating opportunities, providing the supports. And so our hope is that by doing this and being out in front and supporting companies like Macro, and Marcy Ventures, that we're going to continue to see this trend elevate and debunk all of these myths that have been circulating within the corporate sector for so long. That's interesting. Um, I, I, there's no question that there's biases and, and myths. I, I'm kind of curious what you tell them about what replaces that, right? So so when you get mm -hmm. like, and I'm taken by the phrase that I think comes through in a lot of the documents I've, and, and, and work I've seen Kellogg do about racial healing. Mm -hmm. So like what's on the other side of this, of disrupting the, the negative, the negative narratives. For us, the healing aspect is seeing the common humanity in each of us and realizing the potential that we each bear and that not holding onto false history or preconceptions and misconceptions, not let that be a barrier, but come to it from a place of understanding, come to it from a place of inquiry, take the risk, reduce your risk aversion and realize that the risk will actually pay off in ways in which you've never imagined. And so we try to bring examples of that. And another publication that we put out is the business case for racial equity to really help corporate America understand that this is not something that is just a time and moment, this is the wave of the future. And if you want to stay competitive and if you want to have the best products and if you want to have folks come to you on a regular basis and see you as leaders in the sector, you're going to have to address the inequities within your company. You're going to have to address the inequities in the business practices that you currently hold. Poppy, um, you, you mentioned uh, Raising Dion, which, which everybody loved. And, and now everybody's talking about Blue Bayou. Um, which I think you worked on a, as well. And, and and you talk about kind of, I don't know, shifting people's assumptions about what's what. Um, can you tell us a little bit about, about how you how you saw that project and, and what you were trying to do with it? Um, yeah, uh, very much so uh, shifting conversation and thought around that film. Very proud of that one. Uh, I was one of the producers on the movie. Um, we met with Justin Chan, who is the writer, director, actor, <laughs> producer of the movie, he did everything. And he very much wanted to talk, tell a story about adoption. He was very moved 
by some of the inequities that were happening and and at at the time our our current uh government and their policies in terms of um deportation and so um he wrote a beautiful script i think the thing that appealed to us so much we've done several projects around immigration um and i think a lot of people think immigration has one face and one narrative and this was a very different and it, interesting we were actually making two movies at the same time around immigration and deportation one was blue bayou and another one was called blast beat and uh blast beat featured a colombian family that uh immigrated to the us in 1999 and blue bayou was a more contemporary story but they were you know at its core there was a similar theme and a topic and a family but two very different faces and we felt like it was such an interesting way to shine light on a situation that a lot of people didn't know about by way of telling this family story um and also you know open up conversation about what can be done i think a lot of people don't know that this is going on um again i maintain that everyone i think a lot of people have one face and one narrative of what deportation and immigration means um on the on a larger scale and so this was a way to you know open that up and disrupt that narrative sometimes um you said you said mentioned earlier you know what makes it easier for people to kind of um internalize or integrate uh, uh, you know a story and you know sometimes you hear the pushback oh if you you know sort of beat people over the head with a social message you know that's not doesn't make for good 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 movies or, or good tv um uh but yet you macro and, and a whole crew of other uh, filmmakers lately have been able to kind of pull this together and 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 weave it in in a way that people seem to be able to um, to take in. So, what are you, what are the lessons of that, or what what are the insights uh, to, to being able to sort of be effective at narrative change? I mean, I would like to think that we did really good character development and had a <laughs> had a compelling story to kind of draw people in. I mean, I think there's a difference between doing a PSA and creating a narrative that people can see a version of themselves in, so that they're being entertained but also being educated. I mean, I I'm kind of going a little counter to what you were saying in that we do want to put the medicine in with the cake, right? Or whatever the saying is. Um I think it's it's clear what's at the heart of this story, but I think for both of those films, we really additionally were interested in that shared humanity and showing a family in both stories, families that just wanted to stay together and hoping that people will see themselves in these characters um and and be motivated if by that um and also kind of expand their world view um with blast beat in particular that story was about a family who was doing very well in colombia and most times that narrative is coming for better opportunity in terms of making wealth this was more focused on education and we had a character who didn't want to come to america and so we were trying at every turn to kind of you think you know you know you all you see is this one version and it's more complicated than that and we very rarely get to see latinos wealthy or doing well it's always you know a very similar familiar narrative similarly i don't know if there are a lot of people who have seen a Korean guy with the New Orleans accent <laughs> who's a tattoo artist who's you know got this particular family and dealing with these issues and so you know just in terms of breaking apart clichés and and this constant narratives that we have been fed and like we're different shades and different people and different you know economics and just you know trying to muddy that up a bit Indeed, indeed, Larry. That that actually picks up on something that you mentioned, which is people have kind of um, obsolete or just downright wrong conceptions of what the sort of audience, consumer base, demographics of what people of colors sort of wealth and literacy, education, discretionary spending, and um, and and you've you've sort of 
um, made a, I, I think, a, a, a portfolio out of out of disrupting that perception. But do you think that that um, you think the new thinking is is taking hold um, as as folks see the success of some of, of your investments and other similar ones? Well, there's a lot of different levels where the change takes place, and I think the most important place is, frankly, you know, with the consumers themselves, and you know, by and what I think is underestimated in corporate America is just, and this is this is kind of an old theme, but people just kind of disconnect from the new ways of thinking, right? It, the generational disconnects uh, have been going on since time began. But what's really changed is that Gen Z is really the mobile first generation. So that's the group that, you know, if you were born in 2000, you, you had a smartphone in high school, like your whole high school had it by that point. So it's a, that first digitally native generation is now, you know, literally getting out of college or in the workforce, you know, they're really impacting everything. And, um, I think these generations probably used to feel like maybe they were like 20 years between, you know, the thinking when people were, you know, really thinking about, you know, what's happening with their parents versus them. But people who are, you know, 26, 27, 28 are surprisingly different from the people who are 18, 19, 20, 21, because they weren't a part of that first, that first wave of the digital generation. And they have very, very strong values around, you know, inclusivity as an example. And they have really strong values around, you know, the meaning of products and services. So I think from a pure sort of economic and Darwinistic perspective, the companies that think that they can just keep on doing things the same old way and maintain their market share, you know, I mean, it's just not going to work because when you look at what they're buying and you look at what they're thinking about, it's actually quite different. And it's very difficult for, for older people to actually understand what those new generations are doing. And I think when, you know, you're certainly near around the entertainment industry or anything that's, that's marketing to that younger, you know, generation, there's sort of these natural ways that you figure out how to, how to figure out what's going on. And we actually do a ton of, of research in the Gen Z space as well. So I think this whole notion of like deep values, um, you know, really driving things, new products and services that really fit, that embrace these values. I mean, that's actually what's working there. And it's really a question of, you know, how long people take to figure it out, you know, it's probably more up to them. And depending on what business they're in, you know, they're going to be economically um, learning, you know, harsh lessons, you know, pretty quickly as this emerging economy, you know, really takes hold. I, I think you're right. We've got a 15 year old and, and I, all I can say is, you know, you know, most companies don't know what's coming because, because he, he and his friends are, are whip smart. And, and, and as you said, super attuned to all of these nuances that, 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 that as you say, we have sometimes have a hard time understanding. Right. And they're um, looking at thousands of images a day. And you get to see it because you happen to have the gift of a, you know, of a young Gen Z year in your house. But somebody who doesn't have that, they might think, oh, things haven't really changed as much because people get kind of locked in their bubbles. And, and Carl, that's, that sort of brings up a, mm -hmm. a, a strategy question for, for, for like Kellogg, which is not even yourself, but he, but also the, the portfolio companies and, and, the, and the partners kind of go through the process that Larry uh, w was discussing. Mm -hmm. like, like, how do they change their own story? Sure. So we've seen a seismic shift in the past 18 months of the public's awareness of systemic racism, the need for racial equity and for healing. And we've seen a lot of corporations and financial institutions make commitments to racial equity. I tell folks who are looking who are in that justice space that we need to capitalize on this moment because we don't know how long this moment is going to last, but we also need to follow that with our dollars. Companies are, trend, are tracking how we're spending our resources, what we're spending our resources on. We need to make our investments work. And so when we think about how we work with the investment community, it's really around helping investors 
understand their risk factors and that bias and unconscious bias, race and gender, those are not real risk factors. Those are false perceptions around race and gender that are harmful and will impact their performance. What we've been trying to say is let's foster a process that's going to lead to equity. Let's think about what we really need to evaluate to determine success. And not only are we willing to challenge the corporations and the investment community that we work with, we're also challenging ourselves. What are we doing? We have an endowment. How are we managing that endowment? And I can say that over the past few years, we've tried to be really intentional around who we work with as investment managers. And I can say 20, 26% of all of the foundation's U.S. assets are managed by majority diverse owned firms because we believe that in order for us to challenge and expect change, we have to lead with change. And so when we think about that, we're, we're wanting to be best in class. We want to show that you can get a return on your investment. We want to show that bias is actually a hindrance. And so we're committed to leading that change effort and we're making sure that we practice what we preach. You mentioned that, you know, we don't know how long this moment will last and, you know, often mm -hmm. a sort of a narrative shift gives rise to a kind of counter narrative or a backlash. Mm -hmm. um, I'd love each of you to sort of reflect a little bit whether there's a, uh, you know, pushback you've gotten, or obstacles you faced, or or opposition really that's that's that that um, that's that's arisen, and, and how you've and how you've dealt with it. I don't know who wants to jump in. We're in the sort of um, everybody jump in when you when you want a, a phase of the discussion now. So, um, uh, who wants to take a shot at, at at countering the backlash? I mean, I think I'll, I'll comment and just macro being macro, we have been conducting ourselves as such. <laughs> it, it's not responding to mm -hmm. what happened this summer or responding to this trend, which I hope is not a trend. I think conversely, it's more about how we're interfacing with some of the studios or the other companies um, and, and modeling for them what they should be doing and what they should be making um, in that regards. I think, you know, seeing the change. I mean, certainly over last summer, I had a lot of friends that got a lot of job offers as companies were looking to, you know, look at themselves inwardly and see what their ranks were looking like and make the, make those changes. But I think to your point of like, it needs to be more than just hiring one executive. It needs to be a bigger change and a change at the higher levels as opposed to at the lower levels where they are not empowered. And it also needs to be a change in terms of content and really backing that up with dollars. And so I think for us, if we're able to contribute to that, we are effectively leading that conversation. Um, but it, it is a challenge because I think it's like, at what level is that change happening? And it does need to happen at a higher level for the content right. to get through the way it needs to. Right. Larry, um, um, Marcy Ventures is a majority black owned and and um, and, and relatively unique in, in the VC world. Um, uh, that might that might ch uh, change some some perceptions, you know, just on the face of it. But um, I don't know. Is there backlash or, or uh, in some way? Does that you know, what are the obstacles? Sure. Well, look, we were we raised our first fund, we had our first close back at the end of the first quarter of 19. And, you know, I don't think as we were having a uh, conversation with people that that was somehow viewed as a positive that we're majority black owned. But I think that, you know, being an example is so powerful. And by being, you know, a majority black owned VC, but that's actually an amazing performing VC. And that makes people think, hmm, Maybe, you know, maybe this firm, you know, is really onto something here. I need to understand more about that. And then maybe other people who might not have thought, oh, I could be in VC, I could be a capital allocator. You know, maybe there's some real inspiration there. And, and that's really, you know, meaningful and exciting, you know, to, to kind of be that, to be that example also. And I think we've also, you know, really been, uh, in addition to kind of the, the investment success with, with backing such great companies and, you know, how they're performing, you know, as a VC, we've really um, been growing and, and our second fund, 
you know, is really um, going to be, uh, you know, among the largest, if not the largest, you know, that's been raised by a majority of black owned VC as well. And that's something that, you know, we want to just be the best performing, but I think that that example is very important. And it also helps entrepreneurs be inspired and say, Hey, you know, I really want to work. You know, maybe they don't feel like uh, they know where to go or who to raise money from. And, you know, we can be thought of as a, as a great place, you know, where we're finding these really out, uh, you know, these outlier, you know, entrepreneurs. Uh, it's fantastic. Terrific. And you've, and you've also brought in, uh, you know, a, a number of, 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 of entertainers and celebrities and, and, mu- and musicians and singers, um, maybe changing a little bit of the narrative um, around them as, 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 as investors um, and, 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 and saying there's, there's more than just their, their cultural work in some sense, but there's also now they're putting their financial uh, uh, power to work. Well, absolutely. And if you, you know, look at my partners and um, you know, what, what they, you know, co-founded and built around with rock nation and they're thinking around, you know, people as brands and, and how, you know, they've been able to actually, you know, uh, develop, you know, incredible talent that really turns into a brand. Um, so I think there is this, this thing about wealth creation and investing that is very important, you know, and core to, you know, that kind of education and that sort of inspiration. And I think, you know, more people are, are focused on that. So we're, we're happy to be a part of that narrative as well. Terrific. Carla, um, um, maybe we'll let, let you kind of um, um, take us home and, and, and pull this all together in the sense that um, uh, you've got some terrific stories here and the rest of your mm-hmm. portfolio around narrative change. I mean, what is the next kind of challenge that you want to tackle? I mean, where, where does yeah. this go in the next year or a couple of years? Right. So narrative change isn't stagnant. And we want to have folks partner with us in combating bias and false claims. We want to lead with purpose by making investments that lead to systemic change. And we're in the midst of what I think is an awakening of the intergenerational challenges that folks are ready to be front and center with to combat the status quo. We know truth telling isn't nice. We know that not everyone will agree. We know that folks will challenge us and our interpretation and our lived experiences. But we also know that there's a greater population that are increasingly understanding what is required and that truth telling, while it may not always be nice, it is mandatory. And it's why Marcy Ventures and Macro are helping us to hold the line around pushing narrative change as it relates to community of colors, debunking myths, demonstrating values, leading with conviction. And what I want to tell folks is that the returns are there. There's no question about that. It's whether or not you have the courage to stand up and do what you know is right and whether or not you're willing to put your biases aside and be that supportive force for the great work that we know that's been untapped for generations. Well, and terrific. so I just want to thank Marcy Ventures. I want to thank you. I want to thank Poppy. I want to thank Larry for really coming together and telling your story and really helping us to see and bring to life what the investment has created and helped to create and just looking for many more wonderful opportunities of partnership in the future. Well, um, terrific. I mean, I think if you say the returns are there and all you need is, is courage in a sense, that is a sign that the narrative is, is shifting. And um, uh, at Impact Alpha, we always say uh, uh, we say follow the money. We also say follow the talent. Um, and there is a lot of talent uh, going towards this. And I think the that 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 will help um, uh, shift the narrative going forward. So uh, you all are, are are part of that talent, uh, and so I want to thank each of you for for joining us. And again, thanks to the Kellogg Foundation and thanks to SoCap for for having me and for bringing us together. So um, narrative for change. Um, share your narrative uh, back with with us at Impact Alpha, and we'll try to do our best to push it out as well. So thanks to everybody.